a God who has us in his hand. I pray tonight that we would trust that God with our lives. Trust that God with our schools. Trust him with our families. We thank you for the testimony we've heard tonight. And we pray tonight as we think about those who walked around our school systems today and our school buildings. And God, show yourself mighty in those places. Encourage and lift up every teacher, every personnel that's there, every bus driver. I know it's a public government building, but you're still God. And may those youngsters, from the smallest to the oldest, feel your presence in that place. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. If you didn't get to come and uh, walk tonight around the schools, you missed a blessing. It was good. Uh, I, I did this five years ago when I was here before, when Steve, after Stephen came, and and uh, but it was just something special tonight. I I don't know why Marla gave me the biggest school to walk around, but uh, next year I'll make it all the way around. I I didn't do it tonight. But you know, as I stopped and I put my hand on those vehicles and prayed for the people that came in those vehicles, and I put my hand on that wall and I prayed for all the teachers and those students. I put my hand on that gate and I said, everybody that walks through this gate. Hmm. Now folks, we prayed, let's believe that God's going to do it. Amen? Amen? Let's believe that God's going to do it. Just not saying the words. Let's believe that God's going to do it. Amen? I'm telling you, I'm excited. I'm pumped. I'm ready. Let's start school tomorrow, Bill. Where are you? <laughs> uh, you know, Vanda's testimony. You know, sometimes the people that appreciate grace the most are the preacher people that have to go down the furthest. They have to taste all that life and sin and rebellion has to bring before they get to the end of themselves and, and come to Jesus and, and, and give in. The story of uh, the Amazing Grace, the song that's so well known and so popular for many, many years now, was written by a preacher. His name was John Newton. And John experienced that truth very much firsthand in his own life. Um, his tombstone tells the story, and John wrote these words himself and had it put on his tombstone. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and a libertine, a servant of slavers in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had so long labored to destroy. And I say amen. Amen. That's God's grace. That's God's grace. After years as a slave trader, the wretch that we sing about in that song met Jesus he made an about face to defend the gospel he had so long despised, and he preached the gospel for years and years. I thought this was interesting. It said, amazing grace stayed the center, the central theme of his preaching and teaching throughout his whole life. When it was uh, suggested that he retire at age 82, uh, because he was in poor health and his memory was failing, he, he responded this way, my memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things. I am a great sinner, and Jesus is a great Savior. Now, you could preach that, couldn't you? Amen? Ephesians chapter 2 tonight is the verse that we want to start with. It is a verse that we all are familiar with. 
Um, and it talks about grace. Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, and he said these words there. Probably most of you know these words by heart. For by grace, verse 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The song that John Newton wrote, Amazing Grace, says that grace is amazing. What's so amazing about grace? Somebody tell me. What's so amazing about grace? We don't deserve it. That's what grace is, isn't it? It's God's unmerited favor. Somebody has used the, the uh, acronym of the word grace, the letters. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. It's just the favor of God the unmerited favor of God. If we deserved it, it wouldn't be grace. It would be a reward for the way we live. But listen, we don't deserve a reward. So God gives us grace. What else is amazing about grace? Anything else? Amen. Why us? The fact that he would even offer grace to us, extend grace to us. We didn't deserve a thing. In fact, we were enemies of God. Paul writes in the book of Romans, there is none righteous. There is none that seeketh after God. There is none that doeth good. We are all gone out of the way. Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. It's amazing that God would even care about us. It's amazing that he would even extend such a blessed, sweet thing to us as grace. It's amazing because it works. Amen? It works. Do you remember when God saved you? His grace was extended to you, and, and God changed your life, whether you were little or big or older or middle, or no matter how bad or how good you were, but God changed your life. And you know, what's sad to me is the fact that so many times people will come in and, and they will go through the form of making a profession of faith, but there's never any change. I believe when you get the real disease and you get inoculated with God's grace, it makes a difference in your life. It changes you. It's amazing. I mean, I've seen people that, I remember one time at Oak Hill when I was pastoring over there, Sunday night, guy walks in drunk as a skunk. I mean, he was, he was singing, he knew the songs, but boy, it wasn't on key. And, and afterwards, we got to talking to the guy, and he, I said, you know, you need Jesus in your life. Well, I, you know, I used to go to church and stuff. I said, can we just pray with you? Me and a couple of the deacons took him back in the office, and we started praying with that guy, and he sobered up just like that. And he started weeping, and he, he accepted Christ. We got, I got to baptize him. That's amazing. I mean, that's amazing. And I know some of you ladies and even some of the men have unsaved spouses. And it just looks like sometimes that they're never going to come, never going to make the change, never going to accept Christ. Don't give up because there's still amazing grace. And God's still in the business of changing homes and changing lives. And, and it's amazing grace. God's favor, God's unmerited favor. It is the desire and the power to do certain things. Now, when we think about this verse of Scripture, this is the one that a lot of people think about, and it has to do with grace, salvation by grace. And so let's take a look at it for just a minute, but I want to show you a couple more things that grace does and God gives us grace for in our Christian experience. Why do we need God's grace? Well, we need God's grace because there is absolutely nothing that we could ever do to earn God's favor. Uh, if it's earned, it's not favor. It's deserved. It's a payment. It's, it's due. But the only thing we are due is hell and judgment and separation from God forever. So even the best of us, even the best in our world, even the best person, the best church member, the best man or woman, fall short of God's glory and God's goodness and God's standard of righteousness. We are talking about it in our Sunday school class and the members class this morning. I had a really good class. This has been a real blessing for me to do. And, and we were talking about that. And somebody said, well, what happens? And of course, you know what subject we got on, uh, on eternal security. What happens if you sin? What happens if this, and they named a particular 
sin. And if you're doing that, can you still go to heaven? I said, what happens if you lie? Do you still go to heaven? Well, yeah. What happens if you don't come to church when God tells you to come to church? Well, but how about if you don't read your Bible when, you know, you're a believer? You lose your, well, but you see, sin, 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 sin. And we forget about the sins of omission. We, we, fo- we focus on the thing, sins of commission, you know, lying, stealing, cheating, getting drunk, and all that kind of stuff. But it's, it's just as big a sin when we don't live for Jesus, and we don't get in his word, and we don't share our faith, and we're not faithful to God's house, and we, you know, steal from him. Now, I'm going to stop there so you don't feel uncomfortable. But it, the point of this, folks, nobody deserves heaven. Nobody. The best man in Mason County doesn't deserve heaven. The best preacher I know doesn't deserve heaven. That's why we need grace. It is by grace he saves us, not of works. Why not works? Why can't I earn my way? Well, first of all, you can't do it. It's impossible because there's only one standard that God has to get you into heaven, and that's perfection. And I've never met a perfect person yet, except a few wives that thought they were perfect and their husbands weren't. But... Just joking, ladies. I love you. I've met a few husbands thought they were perfect too. So I, and it's sad to me to see people that are entrapped in different means of uh, organizations or, or, or matters of, uh, they call them uh, people of faith, and they believe in faith, but then they add something to it. You got to believe in Jesus, but you got to be baptized. You got to believe in Jesus, but you got to join the church. You got to believe in Jesus, but you got to take communion. You got to believe in Jesus, but I remember when I, the first church I, I pastored uh, was in Pennsylvania, and I'm telling you what, it was a culture shock for this preacher. I left the South, Miami, Florida, born in Georgia, raised in Florida. I left the South and moved to Somerset, Pennsylvania. It's an hour outside of Pittsburgh. And bunches and bunches of Catholics and um, a, a lot of Slavic people in that community. And they're dear people, but boy, I'm telling you, it was a culture shock for me. None of them had grits. Not a one of them. No, they didn't know what they were. Guy one time said he went to preach a meeting and he didn't know what grits were, but they asked him. He was down south, and the waitress said, would you like to have grits, sir? And he said he didn't want to act dumb. He said, yeah, I'll take two. So, <laughs> But the, the, the community and the people were so ingrained with the works concept. We've got to do this, and we've got to do that, and we've got to do that. Yeah, we're trusting in Jesus. He died on the cross, but if we don't, if we don't, Paul said, it's all by grace. And you know what's wonderful about that? Anybody can be there. Anybody can take it. Anybody can receive it. It's offered free. Doesn't matter who you are, what you've got in the bank. It's all of grace. And that day when we stand before Jesus, when he calls us home and we all stand before him, there, there's nobody going to be beating on their chest or sticking their chest out. They're all going to fall down and say, you're the king of kings. It's all because of you. It's all because of you. It's all about grace, saving grace. And it's amazing. By the way, he doesn't force grace on you. He gives you the choice. Now, I know that we'd like to make the choice for some people. We'd like to see those folks that we love and care about, friends, neighbors, co-workers. We'd like to just take them by the neck sometime and say, why don't you get this? But you see, that's the part of grace that's so amazing. He gives them the choice. So we believe in salvation by grace. But I want you to look at another verse of Scripture. If you'll jump over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is what I call sustaining grace. Sustaining grace. Verse 7. This is Paul writing here. And he said, Lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, 
God let Satan send it to him. That's what he's saying. God allowed Satan to buffet him with this thorn, whatever it is, and there's speculation all over, but it doesn't matter what it was, it was bad. It was troublesome. It was a problem for Paul, and Paul is a strong Christian man, probably one of the strongest that ever lived. But look what he says. But lest I should be exalted above measure. Here's something that we got to remember, folks, and this is just a little aside. Even when the devil comes after you, God can turn it around and use it for your good. That's what eight, Romans 8, 28, God works together all things. That doesn't mean everything's good. He said, but he is using all things. He can work together, even the bad stuff, even the tough stuff, even the hard stuff, even the stuff that the devil gets after us with. And he can use it all for his glory and for our good. And Paul said, the devil sent it, but God, you're going to use it. Now, here's what he says, verse uh, 8. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Anybody here ever been through something that you asked God to take away? I raised both hands just like Don this morning. Sure. Sure we have. You hear a lot about the stuff you're going through. What a... Mark Lowry, I like, I, Mark's crazy, and he said, this too shall pass. That's what, yeah. But he says, look, verse 9, and he, that is God, the Spirit of God, said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee. This is called sustaining grace. We got saving grace to get us in, but we have sustaining grace to keep us going. It is the desire and the power to stand up, to be patient, to be courageous, to not cave in, to not whine, to not throw in the towel, to not just give up and just whine about it, but to stand up and say, God's not only gracious enough to save me, God's gracious enough to keep me strong no matter what's coming my way. I think you folks know this because you guys know each other better than I know you, but in just a little time that uh, I've been here, I've got just a glimpse behind the curtain of some lives in this church. Some people that come and they look smiling and they're happy, but they're carrying some serious stuff in their life. I mean some hard things. And it keeps happening because we live in a sinful world. And stuff like that is going to happen. And there's some folks, you're sitting in the pew with them tonight, and you don't know about it, but they're carrying some stuff. They're going through some things. But I have good news for you. God's grace is sufficient. God's grace will sustain you. But it only works if you lean on him. You try to handle it yourself, it's going to crush you. It'll wear you down. It'll steal your joy. It'll wipe you out. It'll take you and just pull every speck of, of perspective and happiness and blessing out of your life. But if you keep your eyes on Jesus, he will give you the grace. He'll give you the grace to spend the last two months with your dad and watch him pass into eternity. He'll give you the grace to deal with children that aren't living for Jesus. He'll give you the grace to go to a job that's hard and people are uns unsaved and ungodly, but you may be the only light they have. He'll give you the grace, sustaining grace, the power and the desire to live for Jesus in the midst of whatever comes our way. One more I want you to look at, verse, 1 Corinthians 15. Just back a few pages. They're saving grace and they're sustaining grace. And then there is serving grace. Verse 15, chapter 15 and verse 10. Again, the Apostle Paul, because he was a man that understood God's grace. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which is with me. Now, you've got to appreciate grace if you're going to do this. 
If somehow you think that you are special, if somehow you think that you deserve God to help you, if you deserve God to take care of you, if you deserve to sit on the pew, if you deserve to be here, then you're not going to understand this at all. But if you understand who you are, if you understand what God's done for you, you'll get the sustaining, the serving grace to serve God. Now, I know when we start talking about serving God, everybody gets, you know, scared. Preacher might ask me to do something. No. Preacher's not going to ask you to do anything, but I'm praying that God asks you to do something. We're going to talk about spiritual gifts next Sunday. The title of the message is Use It or Lose It. By the way, this is just an aside. Next Sunday night, I'm going to preach on the subject, Mansion Over the Hilltop, where we really have one. Oh, boy, that'll get a crowd out, or else everybody will stay home, right? I don't know which one it'll be. I want to tell you something tonight. I, I'll be, a, I, you folks, I hope know me now. now I'm going to be real honest to, with you. Sometimes I just say, God, what are you doing? Why me? Why here? Why this church? Why? I, uh, God, I just don't, I don't know that I can do it. He said, you can't, if except that you have my grace. And the same thing's true for you. Whether you're singing in a choir or singing a special or teaching a Sunday school class or keeping the nursery or going outside in the parking lot and helping cars find a place to park or whether you're cleaning the place up. Listen, folks, if we're going to do it the right way, we're going to do it by God's his grace. If he calls you, Paul said, faithful he who calleth you who will also do it. He will give you the desire and the power to do what he calls you to do. And the problem with so many folks is the reason they get burned out in church and, and, and so forth is because they try to do it in their own strength. One of the blessings of being in the ministry a long time is to be able to look back on all the people who understood serving by grace, and they served year after year after year, faithfully, lovingly, and they didn't grumble, and they didn't complain. Sure, stuff happened, and sure, things occurred and came up, and problems occurred, but they just kept serving Jesus because they had his serving grace. They found what God called them to do and led them to do, and they just did it for Jesus' sake, and he gave them the grace to show up. Even when somebody might complain, they gave them to the show up. Even when it wasn't easy, they gave them to the show up when they didn't feel like doing it. They got his grace, serving grace. They're saving grace, they're sustaining grace, and they're serving grace. And you know what? Every single one of those things, when we get to heaven, we don't deserve anything, but God in his grace is going to reward you and reward your faithfulness and reward your trust and reward your service, reward your patience in difficult situations. He's going to reward us. But the great thing is that we're going to take all those rewards and lay them at his feet and say, Thou art worthy to receive honor and power and glory. It's all about Jesus, folks, and it's all about his grace. If you've never experienced his saving grace, we'd love to introduce you to him. Maybe you're going through some stuff and it just about weighs you down today, tonight. Maybe you just need to come down here and say, God, I need your sustaining grace. I'm about wore out, God. I don't know where to turn. I don't know what to do. He said, turn to me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Look to God for his sustaining grace. Maybe God's been speaking to you about service. Church like this always needs helpers, always needs people to serve. And you say, I can't do it. Maybe God spoke to you tonight and said, you can't, but I can if you'll be willing. Just say, Lord, here I am. I volunteer. 
if you give me the grace to do it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is to be here tonight. Thank you for these folks. Thank you for their faithfulness on a Sunday night. Thank you for the ones that came and prayed and folks that prayed that couldn't come, but they still prayed for our schools and our teachers and our students. God, we're nothing without your grace, nothing. Your saving grace, your sustaining grace, and your serving grace. God, if there's somebody tonight that has never tasted of that grace in their life, they've never known what it's like to be a child of the King, to be born again, to be free from that burden of sin, to know for sure that they've got a home in heaven, not because of what they've done, but because of what you've done. Just give them the courage to step out. May the Spirit draw them to yourself. And God, I know tonight, I know that there's people sitting in front of me that's dealing with some stuff. They come, they sit, they smile, they, they act like everything's okay, but inside, behind the curtain, there's heaviness, there's trials, physical trials, family trials, emotional trials. God, there's financial issues. Give them the grace, the sustaining grace to look not within themselves, but look to you. And God, help us to serve. Not just serve because it's our job, not because it's a duty, but God, serve because you give us the grace to do it, to keep our eyes focused on Jesus and to trust him to use whatever ability, talent, calling that you have to honor and glorify your name. Have your way in this invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing just a moment. If you need to come, you come. <laughs>